thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here talking to all of you, seeing many friends. Um, I wanted to, to talk to you today about gravitational waves and how you can help professional astronomers. Um, this is an artist's rendering. We don't have the ability to make such good pictures of something called a kilonova. It's the merger of two neutron stars. We heard a nice talk earlier about neutron stars. They're dead stars. They're basically very large balls of neutrons. And sometimes they orbit one another in what are called binary neutron star systems. After a while, these neutron star systems, which are accelerating very, very fast and spiraling into one another, can collide and merge. And for a fraction of a second, they pop up and make a larger neutron star, and then that whole thing collapses into a black hole. This is theory. We don't know this for a fact, but there's a lot of strong speculation about it. During that merger, a lot of material gets thrown off. A lot of neutrons, like bullets, get rained out. And some of those neutrons get captured by the nuclei that were already there in this ejected material. And you all know what happens when a nucleus captures neutrons. Some of those neutrons decay, they give off light radiation, and they turn into protons. When you add protons to a nucleus, effectively, you grow it down the periodic table and you change it into a new element. And it is thought that binary neutron stars are the source of most of the gold and platinum in the universe, probably <coughs> stuff that you're wearing right now. In fact, one of these binary neutron star mergers, one of these so-called kilonova events, could produce 10 Earths worth of gold and platinum. If you can picture solid gold Earth, solid gold, solid platinum Earth, there are 10 of those produced just by an event like this. It is thought. The extraordinary other thing about events like these is that they are theorized through general relativity to produce a tremendous amount of gravitational waves. Those waves propagate out into space and in some cases eventually reach the Earth. That material that is radioactive decaying in the ejecta after this collision, that's producing light and that should glow. So there are two kinds of things that are coming out of one of these that we have the potential to detect. One is gravitational waves, and the other, potentially, is light emission. And those are very distinct things. And being able to me measure both of them from the same object opens up a whole new area of inquiry. It tells us things we've never been able to learn before about general relativity, about how neutron stars merge, about the formation of the periodic table itself. So we really, really want to be able to detect both gravitational waves and light from one of these. So as you know, as you may have heard, within the last few years, for the first time, gravitational waves were in fact detected from one of those. And so far, only once, in 2017. This is a picture of the facility that did it. This is the LIGO experiment. It consists of two centers like these with perpendicular arms enclosing incredibly precise vacuums that have laser beams in And there's one in Washington State, and there's one in Louisiana, and there's a complementary experiment called Virgo in Italy. And these are gravitational wave detectors. And in general, the way they work is as those gravitational waves leave the kilonova and propagate through space and kind of wash up against our world, they stretch in one direction and compress in the other everything. The Earth. Not a lot. We don't feel it. But it's happening everywhere. And you need an incredibly sensitive experiment be able to detect that because that stretching and compression, one direction stretching, the other direction compressing, and then switching back and forth, occurs on a scale that is one ten thousand the width of a proton. These are incredible experiments. You take perpendicular arms, you measure with those lasers very carefully how long 
it is between two mirrors in one direction and how long it is between two mirrors in the other direction. And as that gravitational wave passes through, one direction stretches, the other compresses, those distances change. And it becomes possible to measure the difference in those distances and the passage of those gravitational waves. Gravitational waves detected a few years ago from one of these colliding neutron star binaries. And it was at that point that the hunt was on. Because while this detection was spectacular, it was non-directional. Meaning, while LIGO knew there were gravitational waves coming from that, something that looked like a neutron star collision, they didn't know where it was coming from with any precision. And the universe is filled with galaxies that could have had that collision of binary stars. Thousands of possible galaxies, in fact. And I told you at the beginning, it's really important to measure not just the gravitational waves, but the light as well. If you don't know where to point your telescope, if you don't know which of these galaxies is hosting the thing that emitted those gravitational waves, that collision of two neutron stars, then you're out of luck understanding a lot of the things that we want to understand. How do you find it? That glow of light is going to be point-like. It's going to be like a single bright star in a galaxy that you don't know where it looks on this scale. In fact, the uncertainty in the position on the sky was about 30 square degrees. You could fit 150 moon images in the area of the sky where the host of this gravitational wind event could have been. People didn't know where it was. So what do people do? Maybe, maybe there are a few hundred professional astronomer telescopes in the world that could look. What were the strategies to try to find this glowing new star in one of these thousands of galaxies? Well, you might imagine that some people cranked out instruments that would take pictures, images, of a big chunk of the sky at the same time. And that's what some people did. So instead of focusing on individual galaxies, Asking, well, if I could make a picture of all these galaxies at once, maybe I'll see something. That would be efficient. But the problem is, when you do that, that your spatial resolution, your ability to see fine details like a small point of light that may not be that bright compared to the galaxy, is degraded. And it's actually hard doing that to find this theorized, faint, growing dark of dot of light. What else could you do? Well, you could crank up the telescopes to which we have access and contact all your friends and try to get an image of this galaxy or an image of that galaxy or an image of that galaxy. A slow, painful, one by one or two or three at a time process. They found it. Here's a picture of a galaxy. Here's the first discovery image ever of a source associated with the gravitational wave. See that dot? It wasn't there before. But it took the entire world's astronomical community 11 and a half hours to find it. With everybody looking who could all the time. And that was really frustrating. Because a lot of the physics that I mentioned before that we really want to understand in concert with gravitational waves happens in the first 30 minutes. Is there a new approach? So I tried to illuminate. Let's talk a little bit about perhaps a new innovation. And like everything else these days, let's jump on a buzzword. Crowdsourcing. There are thousands of non-professional astronomers in the world, so-called amateur astronomers, but there's nothing amateur about these people. Oftentimes, these are folks 
who could be retired, who are or seriously into the hobby to the tune of buying and equipping, in some cases, personal home observatories worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. They take images, analyze images very much as so-called professional astronomers. <laughs> and they're all over the world, and there are thousands. What if we made friends? What if we got the word out? Which is part of what I'm trying to do today. <laughs> to let people know that if you join us on the so-called Hot Shots Project, and you have the capability of taking pictures of individual galaxies, when the next gravitational wave alert comes from the LIGO experiment, we will give you a galaxy to observe for us, and we will match you to a galaxy. It's like a cosmic matchmaking <coughs> experiment. Each observer who signs up will get their own galaxy to look at so they can see individually whether or not they can find this new point of light that we think is associated, has to be associated with the gravitational wave path. And of course, it only gets better when you sign more people up. And they're distributed all over the world. So that more and more galaxies of the thousand that could be hosting this gravitational wave event get assigned to individuals. And instead of going one by one or a few at a time, instead of going in series, we're going in parallel. We're crowdsourcing the follow-up with the aim of doing it within the first 30 minutes. So this is our website. That's our domain name. Uh, look us up. You can get on and learn a little bit more about gravitational waves and follow, following them up. People can sign up if they have the telescope and capabilities and are interested in this project. But in a moment, I'll also tell you about how you can participate even if you don't have to. So far, we have close to 100 observers worldwide who signed up for this project. Here are a few of their home observatories, which are pretty extraordinary. You can see there's no cookie-cutter design to home observatories. People uh, have their own preferences and sometimes have something very, very beautiful and personal to them. And here's a sampling of all the galaxies that we have in catalogs just waiting to be assigned. And